The Four Monopolies, State Control of Money, Land, Movement, and Ideas. First in the importance of its evil influence, they consider the money monopoly, which consists of the privilege given by the government to certain individuals, or to individuals holding certain kinds of property, of issuing the circulating medium, a privilege which is now enforced in this country by a national tax of 10% upon all other persons who attempt to furnish a circulating medium, and by state laws making it a criminal offense to issue notes as currency. It is claimed that the holders of this privilege control the rate of interest, the rate of rent of houses and buildings and prices of goods, the first directly and the second and third indirectly. For say, Prudhoe and Warren, if the business of banking were made free to all, more and more persons would enter into it until the competition would become sharp enough to reduce the price of lending money to labor costs, which statistics show to be less than three-fourths of one percent. In that cases, the thousands of people who are now deterred from going into businesses by their ruinously high rates, which then they must pay for capital which to start and carry on a business, will find their difficulties removed. If they have property to which they do not desire to convert into money by a sale, a bank will take it as collateral for a loan of a certain portion of it market value at less than 1% discount. If they have no property but are industrious, honest, and capable, they will generally be able to get their individual notes endorsed by a sufficient number of known and solvent parties, and on such business paper they will be able to get a loan at a bank on similarly favorable terms. Thus, interest will fall at a below. The banks will really not be lending capital at all, but will be doing businesses on the capital of their customers. The business consisting in an exchange of the known and wildly available credits of the banks for the unknown and unavailable, but equally good credits of the customers and a change thereof of less than 1%, not as interest for the use of capital, but as a pay for labor of running the banks. This facility of acquiring capital will give an unheard of impetus to business and consequently create an unprecedented de demand of labor a demand which will always be in excess of the supply directly to the contrary of the present condition of the labor market. Then will be an exemplification of the words of Richard Cobden that when two laborers are after one employer, wages fall, but when two employers are after one laborer, wages rise. Labor will then be in a position to dictate its wages and will thus secure its natural wage, its entire product. Thus the same blow that strikes interest down will send wages up, but this is not all. Down will go profits also, for merchants, instead of buying at high prices on credit, will borrow money of the banks at less than 1%, buy at low prices for cash, and correspondingly reduce the prices of their goods to their customers. And with the rest will go house rent, for no one can borrow capital at 1% with which to build a house of his own will consent to pay rent to a landlord at a higher price rate than that. Such is the vast claim made by Perdone and warned as to the results of a simple abolition of the monopoly of money. Second in importance comes the land monopoly, the evil effects of which are seen principally in exclusively agricultural countries like Ireland. This monopoly consists in the enforcement by government of land titles which do not rest upon personal occupancy and cultivation. It was obvious to Warren and Perdone that as soon as individualists should no longer be protected by their fellows in anything but personal occupancy and cultivation of land, ground rent would disappear, and so usury have one less leg to stand on. Their followers of today are disposed to modify this claim to the extent of admitting that the very small fraction of ground rent which, which rests, not on monopoly but on superiority of soil or site, will continue to exist for a time and perhaps forever, though tending constantly to a minimum order conditions of freedom. But the inequity of soils which gives rise to the economic rent of land, like, like the inequity of human skill which gives rise to the economic rent of ability, is not a cause for serious alarm even to the most thorough opponent of usury, as it is nature is not that of a germ from which others and graver inequalities may spring, but rather that of a decaying branch which may finally wither and fail. Third, the tariff monopoly, which consists in fostering production at higher prices and under under favorable conditions by visiting with the penalty of taxation those who patronize production at low prices and under un under favorable conditions. The evil to which this monopoly gives rise might more properly be called misusury than usury, because it compels labor to pay not exactly for the use of capital, but rather, rather for the misuse of capital. The abolition of this monopoly would rest in a great reduction in the prices of all articles taxed, and this saving to the laborer who consumes these articles would be another step towards securing to the laborer his natural wage, his entire product. 
Perdon admitted, however, that to abolish this monopoly before abolishing the money monopoly would be a cruel and disastrous policy. First, because the evil of scarcity of money, created by the money monopoly, would be intensified by the flow of money out of the country, which would be involved in an excess of imports over exports. And second, because that fraction of laborers of the country, which is now employed in the protected industries, would be turned adrift to face starvation without the benefit of the insatiable demand of, for labor, which a competitive monopoly system would create. Free trade and money at home, making money and work abundant, was insisted upon by Perdon as a prior condition of free trading goods and with foreign countries.